we doing every Sunday morning? Say it with me. We are loving the Word, and we are learning the Word so that we can live the Word. Pray with me. Father, we bow in your presence this morning. So grateful for another opportunity to learn from your heart, from your living Word. We are humbled today, Lord, that you would draw us into fellowship with you, that you would cause us to understand how desperately we need your presence and your anointing, your power and your deliverance. Bless our families, our marriages, our relationships today, Lord, our future relationships. May everything we touch be, be saturated with your word, your presence. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. This uh, month we've been talking about the family clinic. Now, you know that we are a general hospital church We've got uh, geriatric wing and long-term care. We've got emergency care. We've got a pediatric wing. Um, We've got uh, every kind of ministry possible. But uh, understand that God loves the whole family. Can you say amen? God wants to minister to the whole family. Families are fun and funny and challenging. If you're in a family, you know that they're fun and funny and often challenging challenging. Can I get a good hearty amen? That is the truth. But family is high priority to God. Family is high priority to God. Remember that God created family before he created a nation, before he created government, before he created a church or any kind of club or organization or fraternity. God created family first. Amen. Family is high priority to God. Understand this. Marriage is high priority to God, really high priority to God. In fact, God created marriage before he created family, right? Absolutely. Think about it. Children are high priority to God. God loves children. And if you don't love children, something is wrong with you. I didn't say you have as much patience as everybody else does. But if you don't love children, you need the Father's heart of God birthed in you. Can I get an amen in this house? Children are high priority to God, but this is what I want to talk about this morning. Fixing what is broken is extremely high priority to God. Fixing what is not working is high priority to God. In fact, God doesn't throw away broken things. God doesn't throw away broken people. He heals, he restores, he delivers, he makes right. He's a blessing God. So we're going to talk this morning about description or diagnosis, okay? Because we want hope and healing for our families, amen? We want a good future. We want it to be better than it was. But we're going to ask ourselves a question this morning. Do we want a description or do we want a diagnosis? If any of you have taken your car to a mechanic, I hope you haven't had this kind of problem. Imagine you take your car to your favorite mechanic, and he says, what's wrong? You said, well, it's making this, this, this strange sound. He says, well, let me take it for a test drive, hook it up to the computers, I'll get back to you. He comes back an hour later and says, I'll tell you what your problem is. you got a really weird noise in your engine. You would say, it's, it's, wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. That's why I came here. That's, that's what I want you to tell me. What is the problem? Well, what's causing it? He's, oh, oh, okay. Uh, what's causing it is a really loud click, click, clank, 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 click, click, clank, clank, clank. Is that, that, that's the problem. How many know you'd find a new mechanic? Okay. Now, imagine you go to the doctor tomorrow morning because you get a really a problem with your left arm. The doctor says, come on in, what's the problem? I got this, it's my, my left arm, I got a really, re, it's really bothering me. He says, oh, let me take an x-ray, an MRA, blood test, let me get back to you. He comes back an hour later and says, I'll tell you what your problem is. You've got real pain in your left arm. Doctor, that's why I'm here. I need to understand what's happening. Oh, well, it's really, let me tell you what's happening with your arm. It's really, really hurting badly. Okay. How many understand that's a description, not a diagnosis? Now, I hope you don't have a doctor like this that says, well, let me help you with that pain. Here's some painkillers. 
Take three of these, but don't you dare try to drive while you're taking these, okay? It'll make all the pain go away. But what's causing it? I want it fixed. Just take these pills. That's not a good doctor, is it? But isn't that just what the world does with all of our problems? They describe them, and then they offer a painkiller. You know what you need to do? You need to get out more, go to more parties, drink a little more, take this tranquilizer. Here's some drugs to make the pain go away. No one's fixing the problem. No one's diagnosing the issue. Well, a lot of people in marriage are not acting like they're married. A lot of people in families are not acting very family-like. We call this family dysfunction, family disorder, families that are broken, families that need fixing. And what are some of the symptoms? What are some of the, the, the uh, results of this? Think of families that are broken. There's, could there be anger there? Right? Could there be fear? Could there be dispi- suspicion in a family? Could there be distance? When a family is dysfunctional, don't you find a lot of blaming going on? Blaming? If you didn't, if you did, if you hadn't, if she hadn't, if, de- if he did. Blaming goes on. Fear, coldness. We can list a lot of symptoms, but understand they're just the symptoms. They're not the problem. If a family's broken and has all these kind of painful symptoms... That's not the problem. That's the result of the problem. Can we get honest enough today to understand that Dr. Jesus not only takes care of the symptoms, he wants to come in, the great family physician, and heal the problem. So let's look at this morning in a very general case, in a very general way, what can be some of the root causes, what can be the diseases that cause families to have so much dysfunction. What is the root? It could be sin, right? Can we be honest? Are we in church this morning? Are we in a truth-telling church? Families can be broken because of sin. Sin is direct rebellion and defiance against the revealed will of God. When God says don't and you do, that's sin. When God says do and you don't, That's sin. When you defy God and say, I will do it my way, that's sin. And sin brings brokenness. Sin brings failure. Sin brings shame and hurt. And you could say, well, what about all the people who are doing it not even knowing they're disobeying God? They're doing it because their mothers did it. Their fathers did it. Their great uncle Bert did it. Their grandfathers did it. They're just passing it on from generation to generation. Here's the problem, friends. Whether you're disobeying God defiantly and consciously or disobeying God out of ignorance, it makes no difference. We're still guilty. We're still broken. If you're eating rat poison and you know it, You're trying to kill yourself, right? If you're eating rat poison and you don't know it, you're still going to die. Am I telling you the truth? But, oh, I want you to know there's glorious hope in Jesus. There's wonderful healing in Jesus. There's recovery in Jesus. He comes to heal the pain, and he comes to get the, the rat poison out of our lives. Sin breaks things, breaks relationships. What are some of the root causes? Ignorance, not knowing how. It is a fact of life today that most of our young families doing their best to raise kids, most, I say most, were not raised in functional homes anymore. If you were raised with a mom and dad who loved each other and grandparents who loved each other, you can go back ten generations and say, oh, they all loved God and they were all happily married. They all were married for 65 years. You are a rarity and you are blessed. You better be passing that generational blessing on down. But many don't have that. 
So they're living and walking in ignorance. What are some of the root causes? It could be learned behavior. This is the way my mama always did it. This is the way my grandmother talked to her daughter, and this is the way she talked to me, and that's why I'm talking to my girls like that. Learned behavior. This is what I've seen. These are, these are the root causes of breakdown. It could be, now hear me very carefully, it could be familiar spirits, family spirits, demonic attachments. Now you can find churches around us that blame the devil for anything. If you sneeze, somebody will run up and say, I rebuke that demon of pneumonia coming on you. Let me explain to you what that is. That's just weird, and it's people that are power hungry, okay? People say, you know, got a demon of dandruff. No, just get some head and shoulders, okay? Not everything that happens in your life is demonic. Not everything that goes wrong. You get a flat tire, don't blame the devil. Check if you drove over a nail, you know? But hear me, we're just as foolish to ignore the fact that there's a spiritual realm. There's a supernatural dark world that wants to destroy us unless we're covered by the blood of the Lamb. So there are family spirits. In other words, if you can identify something that's being passed down from generation to generation, is it possible that if your great-great-granddaddy was an alcoholic and your granddaddy and your father and you and your sons are alcoholics, is it possible that there's a family spirit involved here that must be broken in the name of Jesus? Is it possible that, that uh, there's a curse that's been spoken against you? And again, I, I, don't, I don't fear the devil. He feels, fears me. I'm telling you that when I wake up in the morning, the devil says, Oh, uh, he's up again. Okay? That's the way you got to live. I don't fear the devil. I walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. But I know there's an enemy that wants to destroy, steal, and kill. I also know that Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Life for my family. Life for my marriage. Life for my relationships. Life for this church. Okay, now, we've talked about what are some of the symptoms Now we're looking at the root causes of family dysfunction. Could be sin, could be ignorance, could be uh, learned behavior. It could be familiar spirits. It could be curses. What we need to ask ourselves is, what are we passing down to the next generation? What am I passing down to my kids? You know you're passing down DNA, right? Okay. You know you're passing down your pretty blue eyes. (laughs) You know you're passing down your hair color. You know you're passing down some mannerisms, some personality quirks. It's an amazing thing when you hear yourself talking to your kids like you remember your dad talking to you. (laughs) It's amazing. I'll never be like my mother. And then you speak to your child. Oh, my word, there was my mother. You know, We pass down some things. But what about, what about spiritual things we're passing down? What about bondages or strongholds are passing down. Are we passing down fear? Are we passing down suspicion? Are we passing down anger? Are we passing down a spirit of condemnation or negativity? Are we passing down a generational spirit of poverty and need and brokenness? Here's what the Bible says. I'll give you the bad news before I give you the incredibly good news. Here's what the Bible says. Like a fluttering bird, a curse without a cause will not alight. That's Bible. That's Proverbs. Like a fluttering bird, a curse without a cause will not alight. In other words, you don't worry about birds that are fluttering around, right? They're just, here's a swallow, here's a, here's a robin. It's flying here, twitting there. But a curse does not settle on a person or a family unless there's an open door, unless there's a cause unless there's a, an invoking of that curse. A curse without a cause will not alight. Now, these curses I'm talking about, you can't find in a medical journal. You can't find in a test tube. They are spirits that are attached to a family, and until somebody in that family stands up and says, you stop here in the name of Jesus, it keeps on going. Now, let me tell you the incredibly good news. 
Jesus said, speaking about himself, somebody can shout right about here. You can act a little Pentecostal if you want. If the Son sets you free, you will be truly free. Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, the Promised One, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Captain of our salvation, the Lily of the Valley, the bright and morning star, says if I set you free, you'll be truly free. That's what Jesus said. Now how could Jesus promise true freedom for anyone under a curse? Let's look at Galatians 3.13. Go to Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us. Everybody know what redeemed means? It means bought back. That's literally what it means. A store will redeem something from you. If you you buy something, you want to take it back to them. It doesn't fit. It's not right. They will redeem it. They will buy it back from you. And here's what Christ has done. Christ has bought us back. We were sold to the lowest bidder. And he came along and paid the highest price. Imagine, you buy a sweater at Kohl's. Somebody buys a sweater for you at, from Kohl's. And it's $40. And you can't possibly imagine wearing that sweater anywhere. It's the most hideous sweater Kohl's ever produced. But you're grateful they gave you a gift receipt for it. And you can't wear it, so you decide to put on 40 pounds in two weeks so that you have a real excuse not to wear it. So you take it back to Kohl's, and they redeem it. But they redeem it for $7,000. You say, what what, what, what is this? They say, well, we're going to pay you much more than what it's worth. That's what Jesus did, okay? That's what Jesus did. He took us in our lostness, our sin, our brokenness, our worthlessness, and he said, instead of paying us what we're worth, He paid us what we could never pay. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt I did not owe. I needed someone to wash my sins away, and Jesus came, not $7,000, not a trillion dollars. He said, I'll give the best treasure heaven has. I'll shed my own blood. I'll give my life to redeem you. Now, that's what redemption means. Christ has redeemed us from the curse. You come to me and say, Pastor, I've got this curse on me. I'll say, have you been redeemed? Have you been bought? Have you been washed? Have you been cleansed? Do you know who you belong to now? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Listen, I don't care if the devil himself showed up at your birth moment and said to your mother, you and your seed are cursed from hell. If you're under the blood, that curse is broken. That bondage is broken. Jesus said, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed, and he's cursed for us, becoming a curse for us. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation For those who belong to Christ Jesus. Everybody say, no condemnation. Oh, come on, say that again. Say it one more time. For those who belong to Christ Jesus, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. This is any curse, any bondage, any family stronghold, any generational spirit, anything that's under the curse, Because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the body we sinners have. Oh, think of it. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us. By giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. The question is are you following your sinful nature or are you following the Spirit? If you follow the Spirit, there's no condemnation. 
there's nothing against you. He took the, 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 the sign of requirements and he, that was against us. He nailed it to, our, to his cross, and he has set us free. So very quickly, how do we break free from curses, familiar spirits, bondages, strongholds, things that you, 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 you just know this, this is not holy. Some things my dad and mom and grandparents passed me, I thank God every day for them. Other things we want to break. We want to stop. We, we want to do something different from here on out. How do we break those things? Just a few quick points for you. How do we break those things? First, repent and forgive. Repent and forgive. If you want freedom in your own life, you've got to say, God, I'm sorry for every time I've failed you. I'm sorry for all of my sin. I'm sorry for my disobedience. I'm sorry for doing it my way. I'm sorry for ignoring your word and your truth. Repent and forgive. Forgive yourself because Christ has forgiven you. Can I, say, can I get an amen? Forgive others because Christ has forgiven you. You know, this is kindergarten, but it's, but it's also advanced fourth uh, master's degree, doctoral degree. It's kindergarten because you can't go further. You can't go on if you're not going to forgive. You can't have more victory. You can't have freedom if you will not forgive. Yes, but you don't know what they did to me. And I'd say, yes, I don't. <laughs> but I know what they did to Jesus. That's the question. Did Jesus cover that? Did he suffer for that? Did he become the curse for that? Yes, he did. So repent of your own sin. Forgive everyone that hurts you. Doesn't mean you have to be back in relationship with them. Doesn't mean you need to trust them again tomorrow morning. It does mean you have to release them to God's hands and say, God, do what's right with them. I want to have a clean heart. So repent and forgive if you want to break free from curses. These simple things, you can literally walk out here this morning, a brand new person, if you'll repent and forgive. Secondly, rethink and reframe your mind. Rethink and reframe your mind. What you think about matters. What you meditate on creates your world. What you think about determines your day. What, what you're, what's going on in your mind? And some people struggle with uh, racing thoughts, and you can't shut down your mind. That's not a blessing. And if it's not a bless, it's a, yeah, it's a curse. If it's not a blessing and it's bad for you, it's a curse. So you can say, in the name of Jesus, I have the mind of Christ. I'm going to think God thoughts. I'm going to think of what is lovely, what is pure, what is a good report. And if you can't control your mind, I'll tell you something you can control, your mouth. And if you begin to speak the right things, your mind will come in line with it. It's the actual truth. Rethink and reframe your mind. Replace your doubt with faith. Replace your doubt with faith. I don't know. Yes, you do. I don't know if God can. Yes, you do know. I don't know if God will. Yes, you do know. Replace your doubt with faith. God will bless those who believe his word. God blesses those who understand he means what he says, and he says what he means, so you've got to replace your doubt with faith. This is how we overcome the world, the flesh, the devil, strongholds, curses, familiar spirits, even our faith, the Bible says. Reverse the curse by rehearsing verses of truth. Reverse the curse by rehearsing verses of truth. If, you, if the devil comes to you and says it's always going to be this way, you respond by saying, I am a new creation in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And how long do you say that? You say it until you believe it. You say it until you receive it. And you say it till the devil knows you believe it and stops bothering you anymore. You rehearse the verses of truth to reverse the curse. Hmm. And finally, doesn't mean I'm ending the message, it's just the final in this little point here. You respond to deliverance ministry. 
you respond to deliverance ministry. Now, I say this carefully because not every problem you've got needs deliverance. But if you're a Christian, hear me now, that's been walking with God for a lot of years and this thing from your family or generations is still holding you down, still pressuring you, still robbing you. Now, listen, I'm not saying every sleepless night is an attack of Satan. Sometimes it's just just a blessing to, to spend some time with your loved one. In fact, the last few months, Valerie and I have had a lot of sleepless nights. I don't know what it is, but we're laughing about it. There's nothing bothering us, nothing concerning. But just last week, <clears throat> 2 o'clock, I was feeding her cereal. <laughs> 3 o'clock, uh, was it watermelon? We got some watermelon. 4 o'clock, it was, uh, I think we had some ice cream in there. We're just laying in bed trying to go to sleep, but sleep wouldn't come. So they laugh about it. We watched a stupid old movie, some science fiction thing. Wow. That was really... You know, not every sleepless night. Sometimes you're just having fun laughing at each other. Go down and get her some celery and come back. Hey, how you doing? Still awake. It's actually funny. You should have been there. It's really, really funny. It was what? Cereal. Yeah, we went over that. Cereal, celery. It was uh, watermelon. Yeah, it was quite, quite. A, we're having a few of those nights. Now. It might be because all the kids are now gone and we're just, you know, getting to know each other again. Hallelujah. <laughs> But now, listen, if you can't sleep and you can never sleep and it's robbing you of joy and robbing you of victory and you're a Christian, hear me carefully. Demons cannot possess a Christian. Christians cannot be possessed by demons. Possession means ownership, right? You're either owned by Jesus or owned by the devil, and Christians can't be owned by anybody but Jesus. But Christians can be attacked by and oppressed by spirits if they don't know how to live above them and put them under our feet. The God of peace will crush Satan under our feet shortly, soon. Somebody tell me what time it is because there's no clock up there. There usually is, but lost the clock. Four minutes to 12. We've got many hours to go yet. Hallelujah. So what I'm saying is this. Investigate the possibility that you need somebody to lay hands on you and break curses that are over your life. Respond to deliverance ministry. Respond to the possibility that you might need something prophetically spoken over your life. Let me close with a couple of stories that I'm an expert on because I was there. They happened to me, okay? I was eight, nine years of age and developed severe abdominal pain. I was absolutely overcome by this. Sometimes it would shoot down my legs and I couldn't walk. The doctor prescribed crutches because they couldn't find out what was wrong with me. Took every kind of blood test, every kind of x-ray, couldn't figure out what was causing these abdominal pains that would shoot down my legs and I would, I would ball up. I was healthy. I was running, playing baseball and everything. But when these attacks would hit me, they couldn't figure it out. We were on vacation one, one uh, Friday night, and, we got to, and I just got to the beach, and I was running on the beach, and bam, this pain just doubled me over. They picked me up, took me to the emergency room of the local hospital, and a sensitive young doctor there asked about all the tests that I'd ever been through, asked about all the, 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 the blood tests and x-rays I had, and he crossed everything off, and he said, well, can I talk to you, Mom and Dad, alone for a minute? How and out? <laughs> they asked my parents, has your son been through any trauma lately? My parents said, well, yes. I said, tell me about it. In the past year, my cousin, 13-year-old cousin, was killed tragically. Loved Preston. He died in a bicycle accident. My grandfather, this all happened in one year. My grandfather passed away. I spent every afternoon with him coming home from school. My great-grandmother who lived in, a, lived in our home, Nana, passed away in our house. And my little cousin, who was an infant, sleeping in the crib beside me, I woke up one morning and saw him strangled in the crib 
beside me. And the doctor said, with all of these deaths, how did little Miles, I was little, I was little then, how did he respond? And my parents said, well, it was amazing. He went to every funeral, never shed a tear, never cried. He smiled. He hugged people. But in all these events, he was very strong. And the doctor said, it might be, it might be that this is inner pain, that this is heart pain, this is emotional pain that he's never expressed. And his body is saying, let it go, hurt, it's okay. My parents never told me that, but they came out of that meeting with the doctor. I don't know if he's a Christian, don't know his name, never heard of him since. It was in a different town. They got in the car before we ever got back to the campground. They laid their hands on me, and they said, in the name of Jesus, we break this pain. We break this emotional stronghold. We break this hurt in Miles' life. They didn't tell me what hurt it was. I thought they were talking about this pain that I couldn't walk. But they were speaking to the pain in my heart. And I said, thank you, Mom and Dad. I felt better. And from that day to this, I've never had that problem since. Somebody say, praise God. So it's made me pretty sensitive to people who have psychosomatic illnesses and, and, and hurts. And, and somebody says, well, it's all in their head. I say, is the head attached to the body? Okay. But I also know that there's victory. There's deliverance. There's an answer, and it's in the blood of Jesus, and it's exposing the enemy and bringing things out to the light of the gospel that Jesus can heal. Jesus healed me when I was nine years old. And now nothing bothers me unless you're dying. That bothers me. And I can express pain over that. But let me tell you one more story. See, that was external issues, not my fault. I didn't do anything to get that to happen to me. But Jesus took care of it anyhow. Let me close with one more story for a young couple. I can remember this couple. They came to church. I was a very young boy. It was a couple of years after God healed me of this. They came to church, young couple. They gave their hearts to Christ. And it was a wonderful thing to see. They came to church every Sunday. But my dad began to notice, he was their pastor, my dad began to notice that they were very sad all the time. Looked like they were always hurting and in pain. My dad talked to them and said, what's, what's the problem? What's, what's the issue? What's your pain? They said, nothing, nothing. We, we're fine. They came to church. Everybody else is happy, jumping, enjoying Jesus, and they're sitting there looking straight ahead. Never touched, never moved. My dad finally sat them down and said, you've got to tell me what this issue is. There's something grieving you. There's something hurting inside of you. What is it? And they said, we're cursed. Dad said, what? He said, they said, we're cursed. Just before we were married, we went to see a fortune teller. And she looked at her palms, and she read our future. And she saw that we'll never have any children, and any children we try to have will die before we take them home from the hospital. And my father said, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And they said, but preacher, five children have already died. My dad said, that's a lie from the pit of hell that you believed, and now Satan has had power over your life. He said, you are now under the blood of Jesus. You are now under the cross of Christ. You are now under the blessing of heaven. You've now come under the watchful eye of angels. And what Satan tried to hit, listen to me, little side point here, Satan doesn't know your future. He does not know anybody's future. He can't predict the future. He can try to create your future if you believe in what he says and you follow him. My dad said, if you'll submit yourself to Christ, repent of going to this witch of a fortune teller and break this curse. No matter how many children have died in your womb or died in the hospital, you will now have as many children as you want because you're under the blessing of heaven. Somebody say amen. Now I can tell you this was 40-some years ago, and their children 
Five children. They came to my dad years later and said, could you ask God <laughs> to just shut it down now? <laughs> what happened? A curse was broken. A curse was identified. The power of the blood of Jesus set people free because the blood of Christ covers everything. The blood of Jesus destroys the works of the enemy. Everybody stand with me as I declare this last verse. 1 John 3 and verse 8. The Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Messiah. Why did He come? To get us to heaven, yes. To get us saved, yes. To forgive our sins, yes. But hear me. The Son of God was manifested. He was revealed. Jesus showed up to destroy the works of of the enemy. That's why Jesus came. That's why the Lamb was slain from before the foundation of the world. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want to pray against curses. I want to pray against familiar spirits. I'm going to pray against strongholds. I'm going to pray against learned behavior. I'm going to pray against the way it's always been done. And I'm going to say over your life this morning that it's for you and your house, you're going to serve the Lord. As for you and your future, you're going to be under the blessing of the cloud of heaven, the Shekinah glory, the heaviness, the weight of God's presence.